Good evening and welcome to the February 1st, 2021 regular meeting of the Mayor and City Council. First item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance and I'm going to ask Council Member Neil Harris to lead us in the pledge tonight. Thank you, Mayor. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, next item on our agenda is reflection. And uh, for tonight's reflection, I wanted to call everyone's attention um, very quickly to the, the passing of a longtime uh, but retired city employee, Cliff Lee, uh, who was an extremely uh, highly regarded member of our planning and code department, uh, did a lot to assist. I was just talking about this with Tom Lonergan uh, last week, he did he did a great deal to assist our economic development department whenever there were um, uh, uh, sort of arrangements and and um, uh, special needs for from a particular applicant. Um, and everybody to a person says, uh, and including myself, uh, say Cliff Lee was you couldn't find a nicer guy than Cliff. So um, we send our fond condolences, thoughts and prayers to his family and friends and let's have a moment of silence, please. Thank you all very much. Next, we have approval of minutes and tonight we have three sets of minutes before us. Um, the first is from the regular meeting on January 4th. What is the pleasure of the council? Mike? Mr. Mayor, I move approval of the meetings of the regular session for Monday, January 4th, 2021. Okay, Lorianne. Second. Okay, um, I will call the roll. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Council Member Spiegel? Aye. Councilmember Harris? Aye. Councilmember Wu? Aye. Councilmember Sales? Aye. And Councilmember Sesma? Aye. Thank you very much. Carries unanimously. The next uh, set of minutes is from the work session on January 11th. What is the pleasure of the council? Rob? Move approval. Okay, Neil? Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Um, Councilmember Spiegel. Aye. Councilmember Harris. Aye. Councilmember Wu. Aye. Councilmember Sales. Aye. And Councilmember Sesma. Aye. Thank you very much. Carries 5 0. Um, next, we have the minutes from the Tuesday, January 19th meeting. What is the pleasure of the council? Rob. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Move approval. Okay. Lorianne. Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. I'll call the roll. Uh, Councilmember Spiegel. Aye. Councilmember Harris. Aye. Councilmember Wu. Aye. Councilmember Wu, we could not hear that vote. No, aye. Okay. Councilmember Sales. Aye. And Councilmember Sesma. Hi. Carries unanimously. Thank you all very much. Um, next, we have uh, our proclamation. Uh, it is Black History Month um, starting as of today in February. And if staff could bring up the proclamation, I'll just read the, the background material on it. And anybody following along can, can read the proclamation uh, at the actual language of it. Black History Month is celebrated annually in the United States during the month of February. The celebration was started in 1926 by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who wanted to bring national attention to the important contributions of Black people to the history of the United States. Woodson chose February because it includes the birthdays of Frederick Douglass, Langston Hughes, and Abraham Lincoln. The city will be celebrating Black History Month with a variety of programs. On February 4th, from 1 to 4 p.m., Casey Community Center will offer a tasty book package including Ron's Big Mission, the story of Black astronaut Ron McNair, uh, a craft project and a related recipe. From February 19th through the 28th, the Arts Barn will live stream The Mountaintop, a gripping reimagining of, of events the night before the assassination 
of civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And on January 26th at 11 a.m., the Community Museum presents by Facebook, Stella's Stellar Hair. Um, and actually that one already happened. I saw that program and that was actually quite fantastic. The, uh, the author, so anybody who's interested can go to the Community Museum um, page on Facebook and view this whole program. Um, the author is Yesenia Moises, and she is a terrific author and illustrator. I was really impressed. The story features Stella, a black girl, as she embarks on an interplanetary journey to get help with her hair. Additionally, the Community Museum will present an interview with Mary Church Terrell, suffragist and founder of the National Council for Colored Women in 1896. Um, so, the recipient of the proclamation tonight that you see on the screen is Byron A. Johns, a leading advocate for educational equity for over 10 years and currently serves as the education chair for the Montgomery County, Maryland branch of the NAACP. Since moving to Montgomery County, Johns has also served as the NAAC Parents Council Chair and a PTA officer. At the state level, he worked uh, to form the Maryland Coalition to Reform School Discipline in collaboration with the ACLU. Open, with the ACLU, Open Society Institute, Advocates for Children and Youth, Maryland Disability Law Center, and the Office of the Public Defender, resulting in passage of several bills improving the welfare of Maryland's children, banning the suspension of young learners, um, and reducing the disparity in discipline for students of color. In 2019, Mr. Johns was honored by the Board of Education with the Distinguished Service to Public Education in Montgomery County Award. Thank you, Steph, you can take the slide down. Um, so we're, we're delighted that, um, that, that Mr. Johns will is uh, receiving that proclamation for us. And next, I would like tech team, if you could bring up uh, Carolyn Muller, and we're gonna talk about naming the new city park at the former CPSC site. And just one more plug for that community museum program, Stella Stella Air. Her illustrations were beautiful, like, like re remarkable. I I was watching that program and I'm like, this we need to get her at the book festival and like she's she's a real talent. Carolyn, welcome. Okay. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Took me a while to rejoin, so I'm not sure what what I had to float through to get here. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you for your time this evening. I am back again to request your assistance in selecting the final name for the new park at the former CPSC site. As you may recall, we initiated a park naming campaign last fall and received over 200 entries. We presented the top few choices at the, at the January 4th mayor and council meeting. At that time, you requested additional research and thought to produce a final list of names. So at this time, staff have now completed the additional research. You have suggested a few names. And so we have now come up with the following list of four proposed names, which include Pleasant View Park, which highlights the historical relevance of the Pleasant View community as one of the first free black communities after the Civil War will also represent the beauty of the new park. Fellowship Park, which also has ties to the Pleasant View community and connotes a place where all people can come together. Goodwill Park, the original land tract was surveyed for a James Plummer in 1721 and records show that it was then called Wickham's Goodwill. Goodwill is defined as a kindly feeling of approval and support, benevolent interest or concern and Veterans Park. This name would honor all of the military personnel who have served to protect and defend our country. So we have Pleasant View Park, Fellowship Park, Goodwill Park, and Veterans Park. So at this time, I can answer any questions you may have, go through the names again. Um, but we would hope that you might be ready to take a vote on these proposed names. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, appreciate. How would you like to proceed? Yeah, we'll we'll we'll. I think we'll have the conversation from here. If any council members have any questions, they're welcome to ask. Um, you know, 
uh, since, uh, first off, I want to thank you and your team and everybody who participated in in pulling together all the, the name possibilities here. Um, since the last meeting and this, you know, this latest crop of names that's, that have been submitted, I am so, I'm really taken with the name Pleasant View Park. Um, I want to give some credit to Ryan for originally coming up with the with that suggestion, um, which it, 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 as soon as it was suggested made all the sense in the world to me, both for its historic significance, which is which is very important, particularly in that part of town, right where the Pleasant View Church was. Um, and also uh, because it it has a great ring to it. I think it sounds good. It's, it, it's a nice name for a park. So I think for, for, for all those reasons and, you know, plus the fact that here we are um, entering Black History Month, um, and this is an important part of our Black history, I think it makes all the sense in the world to go forward with that name. Um, and I'm interested to hear what the council members have to say. Who'd like to go first? Ryan. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, you pretty much said it all. Um, and the reason why I support uh, the name Pleasant View Park is a top choice. Um, I did want to also add that over the course of the last week, I reached out to the Pleasant View Historical Association and Reverend Green, uh, who currently leads the association, just to take their temperature on whether or not they had any issues either of opposition or support for the use of the name. Reverend Green indicated he liked both uh, Pleasant View Park and Fellowship Park. He thought either would be um, a fine name um, and did also uh, make note of the fact that given the historical connection of the site to the Nike missile defense system, it would be nice to have a park name that kind of reflected moving from um, you know, considerations of, of war and defense to considerations of peace. Um, so I am strongly in favor of Pleasant View Park. Uh, that said, um, I could certainly live with a couple of the other uh, finalists that have been suggested, but but that's my uh, top choice. Mike. Uh, I'm in the same place as uh, Ryan. I think the historical significance of the Pleasant View community, the church is actually still there. There's been efforts, community efforts uh, by the membership there, the congregation to uh, restore it to its uh, uh, prime uh, if possible. Uh, but that's a, a longstanding mission. I think the other thing that I think might be uh, relevant here is if there are eventually plans for a building, there would be a, 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 an architectural theme that might be used if a new building is constructed there as well for the park that reflects perhaps the uh, architecture of the Pleasant View Church on uh, on Darnstown Road 28. So uh, my second choice would be Fellowship Park as well. My third would be Serenity but I, I really do like the Pleasant View name. So I'll go for that. Thank you, Mike. Anyone else? Rob, go ahead. Thanks, Mayor. Um, you know, I think Pleasant View Park has a pleasant ring to it. Um, and so I, I, I certainly, it, it's not my top choice, but I would certainly support it. I think it's, it's a Given the historical significance between behind the name um, and the the adjacency to the that community, um, you know, I, it, I I like the significance. Um, I, I probably would put Veterans Park above uh, above that because, uh, well, for reasons stated. Um, I I did want to make a suggestion. I was looking at how we've named all of our parks in the city. And th there seems to be many groups to how we name it. There's three that are named after uh, former uh, recreation directors. And so I actually suggested to Carolyn, maybe we do a Potter Park, but maybe that's too soon. There's three that are named after mayors. There's two named after streets. And um, there's a Christmas Park named after a, a fallen uh, a hero in World War I. And then some of them are just descriptive. Um, and so I'm, I'm I'm kind of curious as to how these things came about and how these parks got named. And, you know, the, the meaning, the, the deliberation and the thought that went into the naming of this park, I'm not sure that deliberation went into the naming of other parks in the city. So I'm just throwing it out there that you know, some of them, particularly some of the less, the more just descriptive names, not the ones that have ties. I don't know. 
think they could have better names to them anyway. Thanks, Rob. One correction, Christmas Park was named after a fallen hero from Vietnam, not World War I. Ah, sorry, sorry. Lorraine, did I see you unmute? Yes, thank you, sir. Um, so I too um, like the uh, updated suggestions um, uh, that were put forth. I like the idea of, um, you know, um, identifying uh, historical um, significance to this park site um, with the uh, Pleasant View community and the story um, so richly um, ingrained into our city's history. And so um, I wouldn't be opposed to supporting the fellowship park. Um, I definitely love the Goodwill Park um, with all of the good things that are being planned for that park. And so um, I'm ready for the vote. Okay, Neil, did you want to add anything or are we ready for a vote? No, I think, I think I'm good. I'm just trying to stop my puppy from eating my room. Understood. Someone want to make a motion? Lorianne, please. Sure. So, Mayor, I'd like to move the approval for the newly named park at CPSC as uh, Pleasant View Park. Thank you. Mike? I will second that. Okay. I will call the roll. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Councilmember Spiegel? Aye. Councilmember Harris? Aye. Councilmember Wu? Aye. Councilmember Sales? Aye. And Councilmember Sesma? Aye. Carries unanimously. We have a name for our new park. Congratulations, Carolyn. And congratulations to the city, because I think this is awesome. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so next on our agenda is public comment. And this is the time when the mayor and council like to hear from anybody would like to speak on a topic that's not a public hearing topic and we have no public hearings tonight so basically anything you city related you want to talk about for three minutes we're we're here to 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 listen um we ask that you state your name uh and address or neighborhood for the record and just so people understand how to uh, make comments i'm going to ask the tech team to play our instructional video this is for anybody who wants to make a comment not this is not mandatory it's only if you want to go ahead tech team Uh, working on a judge, so if you want to move on, I'll just I'll, okay. I'll just don't don't worry about it. I'll just explain. So um, we're on Zoom. We can't we cannot see you or or hear you at this point. If you want us, if you want to make comments, use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, which, if you're actually on your computer on Zoom, you hover over the bottom part of the screen and click on the raise hand button. Or if you're on your phone, you dial star nine. And I see we have uh, two people with hands up. So tech team, if you could bring up Gene Dinwiddie, we'll start with Gene first, um, and then we'll move forward from there. Tech team, you ready? Okay, I see yeah. Gene coming up. Yeah, Gene, just, just state your name and address or neighborhood and go right ahead with your comments. Well, good evening. I'm Jean Dinwiddie. I am at 106 Tulip Drive, and I'm here tonight to represent the um, the Gaithersburg Senior Advisory Committee. And we'd like to um, to kind of restate our position about the Holiday Inn conversion. We uh, we understand that uh, we feel that the uh, the ZTA the vote is tonight, and we feel that on any zoning issues or the ZTA is really outside the scope of our mission, but we are very much, uh, very much want to add more affordable senior housing. And if the city decides that, if you all decide that you want to, um, you know, to be consistent um, past that ZTA, I'd like to know, we'd like to know if you still were, are in favor of putting some affordable senior housing at that site. And those are, those are my comments. Okay, thank you very much. Um, tech team, if you could bring up Bob Dalrymple, please. 
Bob wants you to come up, just unmute yourself, state your name and or address and I say, I'm sorry, state your name, address and or neighborhood and which I, or your company, your affiliation and begin your comments. Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, Bob Dalrymple, I'm an attorney with the law firm of Selzer Gervich and I'm here to uh, make comments on behalf of BF Salt Company and uh, Housing Opportunities Commission. Uh, and the subject of my comments is the ZTA that's before you later uh, this evening. Uh, it's not a great mystery. The ZTA will eliminate as a permitted use, the, um, as a public use, uh, the retrofit of the Holiday Inn site at uh, Montgomery Village Avenue in Maryland 355 to uh, HOC affordable senior housing uh, with you know, some other ground floor uses related to that use. Um, to be clear, we have not and are not now uh, asserting that this ZTA is in any manner a referendum on the city's commitment to allowing uh, affordable housing and, and uh, in, in providing affordable housing, including, including senior housing. I think there's a long track record where you demonstrated that there is a strong commitment uh, to affordable housing. Uh, but it is a referendum on whether the uh, whether the city thinks that the conversion of this of this building, this this vacant hotel site, uh, to affordable senior housing is desirable and is in the public interest. Um, when the Holiday Inn closed, you know we started the process of thinking what would be a good replacement use for it, uh, rather than having it sit there as an empty uh, hotel building. <clears throat> and when it, when the idea of it being HOC affordable senior housing uh, started growing legs. We were pretty excited about it. We thought it was a great, a great use, serving a great public purpose uh, and easily adaptable. Hotels you know, uniquely are uh, adaptable for senior housing or any uh, multifamily housing for that matter. <clears throat> the next steps were to determine how to entitle it. Um, it's not permits, housing's not permitted in the C2 zone. Um, we looked at rezoning of the property, potentially to the MXD zone, but there are master plan issues uh, that would make that highly uh, doubtful. Um, and we started looking at the public fact that it was in the public interest and was a public use and lo and behold, public uses are allowed in the C2 zone. Um, so to, uh, you know, the, there was some expressed concern that the city would be giving up leverage um, if they permitted it, and that's not true, there's an authorizing resolution that the city has to approve. Uh, to cut to the chase, if converting this otherwise vacant holiday in building to affordable senior housing is a good solution, make it a conditional use. That'll give the mayor and council all the review and, and leverage that it needs. Uh, if uh, if you, you don't support that use at this location, then you'll approve the, uh, the text amendment. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Bob. Um, tech team, if you could bring up Candy Warner, please. And uh, Candy, just unmute yourself, state your name and address or neighborhood, and go right ahead. Thank you. My name is Candy Warner, and I am with the St. Rose Pox Christi group. And I also live at Asbury Methodist Village. And I have personally been in the Holiday Inn a few times for coffee to sit and to sit and to talk. There are rooms which could relatively easily be converted into housing for seniors. There are dining facilities, a swimming pool, meeting rooms. What a perfect place to convert into this use. Actually serve the citizens of the city and the county who need this opportunity. The hotel is made for a conversion like this and it has to be a lot better financially than starting from scratch to achieve 160 housing units. And it seems that many people agree. In fact, most everyone does. I believe there are no neighbors that object. People want this done. Please make it happen because we know that you want it to happen too. But there's a little something you have to do to take care of that before that can happen. So we. I'm asking you to please get this done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any other members of the public who'd like to speak this evening? Going once, going twice. Okay, 
not seeing anybody, we will we will um, we will obviously be discussing the the um, zoning text amendment later in this meeting. So we'll we'll, we'll reply to we'll respond to all the uh, the comments at that time, unless council members want to do it in front of the mayor and council. That's their prerogative. Um, because we are moving to from the mayor and city council, and we're starting with council member Lori Ann Sales this evening. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so the past two weeks have uh, been busy with the Maryland Municipal League. We have been meeting weekly since session started. Um, we are reviewing legislation covering uh, any issue from climate change to uh, green businesses to innovative hubs all across our region. And so you can stay up to date with most of the committee meetings, which are now being streamed virtually. And you can uh, find the schedule on the Maryland Municipal, uh, uh, the Maryland General Assembly's website. Um, this year, I am serving on the National League of Cities Transportation Infrastructure and Services Committee. So we uh, met uh, last week to talk about some of the upcoming legislation. Uh, namely the safe routes to schools legislation that um, we will um, be supporting in the upcoming session. Uh, Council member Evan Glass uh, from Montgomery County held uh, a meeting a few weeks ago with Congressman Anthony Brown who's sponsoring the legislation. And as we've seen across the county and across the region, uh, Vision Zero has become more important now than ever with uh, increase in pedestrian accidents. And so this legislation will help uh, improve uh, streetscapes to ensure safe um, streets for our pedestrians and our drivers. Um, the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, Chesapeake Bay and Policy Committee is underway. We kicked off our first committee meeting on uh, January 15th, I'm serving as the chair this year. Uh, last week, I joined the Wells Robertson House, one of three locations in Montgomery County um, who participated in the point in time count. It's an annual survey of homeless persons in the county who are uh, residing in sheltered and unsheltered environments. Um, we were able to connect uh, one of the individuals that we found with medical care as he was experiencing heart palpitations when we found him at the uh, metro station. Um, and so uh, uh, thank you again to our Wells Robertson house. Um, the staff there, uh, we had one who was uh, recognized for a quarterly employee um, uh, awards and so they are really going above and beyond to uh, care for our most vulnerable residents. Um, January 29th, uh, most of us on the council uh, attended the uh, annual economic development breakfast. Uh, we were joined by uh, Maryland State Secretary Kelly Schultz, who oversees the state's economic development programs and initiatives. Um, we were able to talk with her about some of the recovery programs, uh, tax incentives for some of our small businesses that are uh, struggling to uh, stay afloat during the pandemic. And she offered uh, some information about some of those initiatives that are underway and uh, will continue throughout the pandemic. Um, we also toured the 16 South Summit Avenue redevelopment on Saturday which will house the new mayor and city council chambers and our police station. Um, and so that's all I have to share this evening. Thank you. Well, Lorian, there is one yep. announcement I'd like you to do. Okay, I wasn't sure if you want me to do it. Until it's the page 34 in the package. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, all right, so. A closed meeting was held virtually by the mayor and city council on Tuesday, January 19th at approximately 8.50 p.m. pursuant to a motion adopted unanimously. The meeting was proposed to be closed pursuant to the general provisions article of the Annotated Code of Maryland, section 3-305B1II to discuss any other personnel matters that affect one or more specific individuals. 
The topic discussed was the process for annual evaluations for the city manager and city attorney. Present at the meeting were Mayor Ashman, Council Member Harris, uh, Council Members Harris, Sales, Sesma, Spiegel, and Wu. Staff present. Staff present was City Manager Briley, City Attorney Board, and Director of Human Resources, Kim Yocklin. Upon conclusion of the discussion, the closed meeting was adjourned at approximately 9.25 p.m. Thank you, Lorianne. I, I, I think that screen share was a mistake, but okay. um, so no worries. Um, we will move on to Council Member Sesma. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, I don't have a lot. I guess uh, just a reminder that uh, it's just a, almost two weeks ago that we had the inaugural that the un United States had the inauguration of the 46th president of the United States and the 59th vice president. Uh, in case you weren't haven't been paying attention, so I want to congratulate uh, uh, President Biden and uh, Vice President Kamala Harris the first woman, the first African-American and the first Asian-American to serve as vice president. So uh, if you've been waking up uh, the last few days a little bit more relaxed uh, than the previous uh, four years, uh, maybe that's the reason. So anyway, uh, I'm uh, hoping that uh, the, the president and his team are able to get things moving in terms of COVID relief nationally. Um, uh, one of the things that his uh, um, next stimulus bill includes is uh, direct aid uh, to for recovery and expenses associated with uh, dealing with the pandemic to uh, local governments, including municipal and county uh, governments. Uh, that direct funding would uh, the direct funding would not require the money to come through the state or the county. Uh, you know, uh, it, it turns out that over a million. Uh, workers have been laid off from municipal and county governments as a result of the pandemic. And so uh, the much needed relief uh, is, is a big part of that bill. Hopefully uh, it'll be a bipartisan bill and negotiated fairly, but uh, we're all wait, looking forward. That is a major goal of the National League of Cities, the Maryland Municipal League and uh, every municipal government that I'm aware of. So um, I, uh, that's, that's pretty much it. I think uh, the last uh, a couple of weeks ago, I attended, uh, I'm sorry, uh, two Fridays ago, I attended the uh, Region Forward Coalition of the Council of Governments, uh, in which we got a report on the regional economic outlook for 2021 uh, and beyond. And I think our recovery from the economic downturn associated with the, the, the gist of it was that the uh, we're in a long-term recovery phase. It, it's going. It's probably going to be a couple of years before the local economy gets back to where it was before, uh, basically a year ago, February 2020, in terms of both uh, employment uh, and uh, economic uh, uh, status. So, uh, but part of it is also going to depend on how quickly uh, the federal government is able to provide assistance to the states and local governments to, to in in recovery, and also provide aid to those who are uh, uh, most drastically affected by uh, a loss of job, loss loss of businesses, uh, reduction in benefits, et cetera. So uh, we're hoping that uh, you know our that's a big part of the the that we're all that we've all been working on with the Maryland Municipal League and National League of Cities, and we'll continue to press on that. Uh, that's pretty much uh, it. I just I'm I'm very uh, grateful that uh, the rest of the council agreed uh, that the, the the council was unanimously unanimous in deciding on the name of the park, our new park, uh, Pleasant View Park, on the first day of uh, Black History Month. It seems like a good way to start this uh, month, but I guess I want to remind everybody that uh, it's always a good time to know Black history about the United States. You don't have to wait until February to do that. So just keep that in mind. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. We'll move on to Council Member Wu. 
Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, I honestly don't have much to add to that, uh, either council member sales or council member Sessman's comments. And I'm sure council member Spiegel and council member Harris's comments will be equally as good. Thank you. Okay, bold prediction. We will move on to council member Harris. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, let me start with a formal announcement. The mayor and city council are seeking to fill a vacancy on the historic district commission for a full member. The commission consists of five members and one alternate. It strives to ensure that historic resources within the city are preserved, recognizing the sense of place that they provide is valuable to current city residents, key to attracting future city residents, and integral to developing economic generating heritage tourism within the city. The commission is responsible for determining Montgomery County Historic Preservation Tax Credit eligibility, reviewing historic area work permits, conducting courtesy reviews, and nominating potential resources for historic designation. Persons will be considered who have demonstrated special interests, specific knowledge, or professional or academic training in such fields as history, architecture, historic preservation, architectural history, planning, archaeology, anthropology, curation, conservation, landscape architecture, urban design, or related disciplines. The Historic District Commission generally meets once monthly on the fourth Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Resumes and letters of interest should be submitted via mail to the Mayor and City Council, 31 South Summit Avenue, Gaithersburg, Maryland, 20877, or email to cityhall at gaithersburgmd.gov. This position will remain open until filled. For more information, visit the city's website or contact planner Chris Berger at 240-805-1064. Um, just a couple of things that uh, I'd like to add. Uh, the Montgomery County chapter of the Maryland Municipal League this month had a guest speaker, uh, Chief Marcus Jones of the uh, Montgomery County Police Department uh, joined us I want to thank him uh, on, on behalf of myself and the chapter. He shared with us a number of crime statistics and improvements in the crime rate locally in the county, uh, trends, what's going on with COVID, Vision Zero, social justice initiatives, uh, and how the COVID and other events of the past year are affecting morale and staffing of the county's police district. So uh, again, uh, much appreciated, a lot of good information. You know, as you probably know, we have our own police force within the city of Gaithersburg, but we also share resources. Uh, the Montgomery County Police Department uh, also serves us as well. Um, and one last note regarding COVID. At the last meeting, I mentioned that my wife, who is in the healthcare profession, had her COVID shot with minimal ill effects, just a little bit of soreness in her arm for a day or so afterward. Um, I'm in Group 1C and uh, had been a patient of a doctor who's part of the Johns Hopkins Health System. Uh, they contacted me and said they had vaccines available for people in the Group 1C if I was interested. So I drove up to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, got my shot. Again, a little soreness in the arm the next day, but uh, a feeling of relief knowing that I'm at least partially protected and expect a second shot at the end of the month. So uh, when, it's your, when it's your turn, uh, I strongly recommend getting signed up. We need to beat this thing. That's it for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, and, and congratulations. I'm looking forward to my opportunity to get that shot. Um, next, we have Councilmember Spiegel. Uh, nothing else from me, Mr. Mayor. I'll just associate myself with the fine comments of my colleagues. Thanks. Fair enough. Um, I will um, just make note that we have had I'm sure everyone's noticed that not not the biggest snow event, but like a real a fairly long lasting snow event. And I want to congratulate staff for the job they've done in managing it on our streets and neighborhoods thus far. And we, you know, we have several more hours left of this thing, uh, but staff has done a terrific job. So I want to I want to thank them. And I want to note that we will be having a work session next Monday, February 8th, to receive an update from the Montgomery County Department of Transportation on near-term Great Seneca Science Quarter transit improvements and a project briefing on the Washingtonian Boulevard low-stress bicycle connection. Um, as 
all of our meetings these days that will be conducted via Zoom, and you can you can watch it the same way you're watching it now, either YouTube or you're on the Zoom or however else we're streaming it. Um, and again, that will be on um, Monday, February 8th. And then the next regular meeting of the mayor and council will be on Tuesday, February 16th after the president's day holiday on that Monday. And with that, I will turn it over to from the city manager, Tanisha Briley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have a number of announcements and comments tonight, so I'll try to get through them quickly. Um, first, I want to uh, let our residents know, actually all county residents whose household income is 56,000 or less can get their 2019 taxes prepared for free through the Montgomery County Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. The process this year is completely virtual and appointments will be accepted starting today. So please check our website for more information there. I think this was said, but I want to emphasize that um, the 2021 Junior Mayor Contest was launched on the 26th. Fourth grade residents are invited to submit essays about leadership, teamwork, and civility, and they are due April 6th. Um, the long range and community planning staff have been working with many developers to prepare submissions of sketch, schematic development, and final site plans. I think this is a great sign uh, of forward progress with respect to development in our community in the midst of, of the pandemic crisis. Also want to mention that we have, we, as you all know, we have staff doing amazing things all the time. And I just want to highlight a few of them tonight. Um, we have submitted for a National League of Cities Diversity Award for our Census and Youth Mentoring Program. Uh, so some of you may be aware that as a part of our continuing involvement with our diverse community, the city of Gaithersburg partnered with Liberty's Promise to lead a poster workshop to promote citizen participation in the 2020 census. The city's graphic specialist, Samantha Sakelik, led workshops in English and Spanish with ESOL students at Gaithersburg High involved in the Liberty's Promise Civics course. A latent function of this workshop was to familiarize the young people with careers in local government, opening our arms widely to welcome youth in danger of feeling disenfranchised into the halls of their local government and allowing them to see themselves as future leaders. Um, so we think we have a good shot at that award. Awards will be determined in mid-February, but even if we aren't a winner from NLC, we certainly are a winner here locally. And I wanna commend staff for their work on that really innovative program. I wanna also shout out the HR team who's done a really incredible job supporting our staff in a holistic way. It's one of the things that's really important to me as we think about our staff as whole people uh, that you know bring their, their selves to work every day. And HR has worked with partners to bring innovative programming help supporting staff members with everything from personal finances and mental fitness and mental health to a new professional development series that will kick off this month. So as a municipality, we are a labor intensive operation and we count on our people to deliver the vital services to our community. Investing in their well being and development will always pay valuable dividends. And I want to thank the HR team for their innovative work on this front. Also, really want to shout out the um, Parks, Rec, and Culture team. I attended their all hands meeting last week and got to hear their year in reports from obviously one of the most difficult years any of us have ever faced. I don't have to tell you all about the amazing work they did to pivot during the pandemic in order to support our community through the crisis. There are so many shining examples of, of, of new and innovative things they did and working outside of the box. Uh, but tonight I wanna talk about the study bubbles. Um, the presentation on study bubbles was, was so moving. Uh, it, was, it was an incredible short period where they shared about five minutes, five to 10 minutes about some of the work they've done with study bubbles. And if you haven't heard about them, we are supporting a, a little over 50 of our most vulnerable students in grades one through eight. They get a safe and supportive environment that is more conducive to learning oftentimes than they can have at home due to all sorts of conflicts from parents who have essential jobs and don't have the ability to have support at home for their students 
uh, to all sorts of tragic situations that these kids are resilient uh, in overcoming every single day to make their way to the study bubbles to learn and continue to excel and progress in school. So the, our staff, they really are doing transformational work and we, we really um, have to take a moment to thank them for all that they're doing to support these youth. And then I'll just concur with the mayor's announcement there. The city snow team were ready for the worst yesterday. Uh, the storm ultimately underperformed here, but decided to show out for the Northeast. So we will send our thoughts with uh, our, our neighbors uh, up the coast. We have more potential for inclement weather on the way, and this is a good opportunity to remind the public to sign up for Alert Gaithersburg so that you can receive messages directly from the city and the county. You also get smart weather notices and other messages regarding traffic incidents and other, other incidents that impact the city of Gaithersburg and Montgomery County. So I really wanna encourage you to sign up for Alert Gaithersburg if you have not. Um, and that will conclude my report this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Tanisha. Um, appreciate all of those updates. And next tech team, if you could bring up Tom Lonergan and we will have our economic development update. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you can hear me okay? Yes, indeed, go ahead. All right then, just one item tonight for you. The Montgomery County Restaurant Relief Grant phase two uh, began accepting new applications today and will do so through the 10th of February uh, close of business. Uh, beyond restaurants, eligible businesses will include food trucks, caterers, wineries, and breweries that directly provide food service, individual locally owned franchise restaurants and restaurants in hotels and in arts, entertainment, and recreational facilities. Eligible uses will include working capital, such as rent, payroll, job training, purchasing equipment, uh, HVAC system upgrades, uh, purchase of PPP, uh, PPE, rather, and sanitation services. Uh, to be eligible, the business must make its principal place of business in, of course, Montgomery County, employ 100 or fewer full-time equivalent employees, be in good standing with the state, and has not and will not use the funds received for this grant program for the same purpose as funds they had previously received through county programs. If a business has already received a restaurant relief grant, uh, you will automatically be contacted about a phase two grant award. Uh, they don't need to reapply and may be eligible for an additional award of up to $5,000. Uh, and if you did not receive one yet, you may be eligible for a $10,000 phase two grant. Uh, the county's Economic Development Corporation, MCEDC, will be administering this program and will be awarding grants through a lottery system versus a first time, uh, first come, first serve basis, so as not to disadvantage applicants who may need time to pull their materials together and submit an application. Uh, for an application for more interested, just visit the MCEDC website at thinkmoco.com. And that's all I've got for tonight, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, next, we're going to move on to ordinances, resolutions, and regulations. And tech team, if you could bring up, um, okay, this is the first time we've had this staff member uh, before us. And so I'm going to take a shot at this name and we're going to see how close I can get. And <laughs> staff, uh, tech team, if you can bring up S.A. Hobta Salasi. How did I do, Tanisha? Tony, how did I do? S.A. was good. I, I missed your pronunciation as they were bringing me in. I'm yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm going to do an encore. S.A. Hopta Selassie. I think that's I think that's spot on. C.S.A. Yes, so is. that this did not work. Okay, S.A. is just not on on uh, on camera. S.A. Before you even start, how do you say your name? Uh, so it's S.A. Hopta Selassie. Oh, I got came pretty close. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, I'm, you got the drive. Well, welcome, welcome, SA. Um, thank you. Go right ahead with your presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and uh, Council members. Uh, this resolution for your consideration uh, authorizes the city manager to enter into a contract for uh, roadway microsurfacing and associated work. Uh, the contract establishes unit prices 
and retains a contractor for uh, microsurfacing, crack sealing, and uh, and minor works on the adjacent uh, sidewalks and uh, curb and gutter. Microsurfacing and crack sealing are uh, pavement uh, preventive pavement treatments currently implemented in the city. As you remember, we had a similar contract with uh, Fort Myer, which lasted for uh, two years. So the purpose of these uh, treatments is to, to seal the cracks uh, caused by, by, by the weather, by temperature fluctuations. So to prevent water from infiltrating into the, the pavement foundation and causing damage. So uh, these treatments are uh, cost effective and they extend the life of the pavement. Uh, this contract will have initial term of two years with uh, optional renewal term of one year. Project streets for all three years have been uh, uh, identified. Uh, Tech team, uh, can you please show page 39 on the screen? Yeah. Uh, so these are the streets uh, to be microsurfaced for the next three years. Uh, the streets were uh, selected based on the pavement uh, management studies. Mainly, we use the PCI, the pavement condition index that we obtained from the Payment condition survey conducted on uh, in 2018, I guess. Uh, so, uh, yeah, these are the maps for the next three years. The project was advertised on October 26, 2020, and we received three bids. And uh, based on the evaluation we did, we selected M. Lewis Construction, which is uh, the most responsive bidder, and also the lowest bidder uh, in the amount of 1,936,251 for a total of three years terms. Each year's work under the contract will be executed through the issuance of uh, work order. Uh, so uh, M. Lewis have not done work with the city before, but uh, they have worked extensively with, uh, with the county and uh, state highway. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I would be happy to answer questions you may have. Thank you, Essay. Well done. Um, so uh, I appreciate you adding that information about M. Luis at the at the end. That we don't they haven't worked with us before, but they've worked extensively with with other jurisdictions. Uh, questions or comments from the council? Ryan, please, and then Rob. Uh, essay, thanks for your presentation. Welcome. And uh, this is uh, more of a comment, I think, probably for Tony, and it's a little bit outside the scope of this specific contract that we're considering. But I just want to encourage uh, your folks to continue to work with our communications folks in the city uh, to make sure that we're doing the right amount of, of PR and public education on what microsurfacing is. In the last couple of years that this has been used more widely as a solution. I think there's been some questions or some um, uh, expectations from the public about um, what paving is supposed to look like and feel like and what it actually does look and feel like, particularly when we're using new methods. Um, so I just want to encourage you in conjunction with these projects um, to, to do what we can to make sure the public um, has um, proper expectations and isn't surprised and understands why it is we're using this method as opposed to others. Okay, we'll go to Rob, and then I'll let Tony respond to that. Thanks, Mayor, and it's, uh, it's good because I have a question for Tony as well, <laughs> or perhaps essay. Um, it, I, I noticed that uh, Fort Myer, the, the incumbent contractor, did bid. Um, they're a little pricier, about 10% more pricier. Uh, I just wanted to, to hear your assessment of their performance and whether or not there were any issues that would galvanize us to switch to a contractor we hadn't worked with before. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Council Member. Uh, uh, we selected uh, this uh, contractor, M. Lewis, based on the current bid. So uh, uh, they were 
responsive and uh, they were the, 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 the list builders. But uh, as for uh, Fort Myer, uh, yes, we had some you know, minor issues, mainly on the housekeeping. Uh, uh, they, 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 were, they weren't cleaning the uh, project site uh, as much as uh, we wanted them. And then uh, there were some delays in the work, but generally uh, the performance of their work was, was good and uh, the quality of the end product is okay. So the shift to M. Lewis is not based on their, uh, you know, performance, but on the evaluation of the bid that we have here. Thank you, S.A. Uh, Tony, do you, do you want to speak to Ryan's uh, comment earlier? Yeah, I, I actually can speak to, to both. Um, so I'm going to, I'll just start with Rob's and then come back to uh, Ryan. Just to add, Rob, um, Fort Myers is a, is a relatively, well, it's a very large contractor, much larger actually than um, M. Louise appears to be. And what SA relates is actually um, very um, pertinent to, you know, playing into our, our selection. Um, really all, all Fort Myers did for us was um, manage the subcontractors uh, that they had. They didn't perform any of the work themselves. So um, we felt that when, with this contract go around that we wanted to have the prime contractor have more stake in the work that was going on so that they were more responsive to uh, dealing with the situation we were going. We actually did get a fair number of complaints about housekeeping um, from the subcontractors uh, that were doing the work. So um, that was a big factor for us. And M. Luis, this really, this kind of work really seems to be in their wheelhouse and they'll have a stake in this game. Um, it also doesn't hurt that they're um, a WBE. So there was a you know a whole lot of things that I think helped us get to the decision here um, beyond just the price to, to choose them as our um, go around this time. Thanks, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. You're welcome. And Ryan, um, boy, did you offer me a great uh, segue um, because we actually do want to, um, the map that SA shared with you is a part of a storyboard that we've developed. Um, Dennis has been instrumental in, in prompting um, myself and our staff and doing just what you said and increasing the ways that we communicate with the community. Uh, I gotta be honest with you, um, this last year with uh, trying to get out there, get the word out and you know, some door-to-door -door approach was not, we, we had very mixed reviews from the, from the residents as to how good that worked, you know, with COVID and things like that. So, you know, this is a, this is a really, um, ongoing thing for us is to figure out new and better ways to communicate with the public. So one of the things that we're doing is we developed a storyboard that we'll be sharing with uh, via the website. Um, and we actually plan to bring that back to you guys here uh, in an upcoming council meeting to show you just what we developed. But it, it takes you through um, the outlook for our, what, I'm, what I would say was our service improvement priorities and the plans that we have for the next three years. So we actually do plan to share that with you here uh, coming up very soon. Great, thank you. Um, Any other, oh, go ahead, Tony. Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to point out one thing. Um, thanks to our eagle-eyed city attorney. Um, we did realize that we have a, a mission on part of the resolution. So before uh, a motion is made, we just need to amend our resolution as presented to include in the very last sentence um, per year. So it should read uh, for the total of $645,000 uh, per year for the second two years. And I apologize for the omission. Not at all. Okay, so would someone like to make the motion as amended? R Mike, please. Yeah, I'll um, move the resolution uh, as amended. Okay, Ryan? Second. Okay, I will call the roll. All in favor say aye, any opposed say nay. Council Member Spiegel? Aye. Council Member Harris? Aye. Council Member Wu? Aye. Council Member Sales? Aye. And Council Member Sesma? Aye. Okay, carries unanimously. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. You bet. Next, um, tech team, if we could bring up Dennis Enslinger, our Deputy City Manager, and we're going to talk about our um, contract to procure furniture for the new police station slash council chamber. Dennis, please go right ahead. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Tonight we are asking you to approve a resolution to authorize the City Manager to negotiate and enter 
into a contract with Duron Inc. for $581,451. Uh, this purchase is related to the renovation of 16 South Summit, as noted earlier by Council Member Sales. Um, you guys had a tour of the facility uh, this weekend, so you get a better idea of the spaces that we're looking at. The furniture purchase includes uh, the new police department furniture for the office spaces, conference room, and briefing rooms, along with the lobbies and public spaces that are located um, in the building. And as noted earlier, um, that does include the mayor and city council chambers, uh, kind of a council chamber overflow and conference room, and the community multi-purpose room that will also be included uh, with the renovations of 16 South Summit. Um, I will note that we have an addition, if we have additional change orders uh, related to the furniture, the resolution does contain a clause allowing staff to purchase those under our change order policy um, with the contingency funds that we have budgeted for the 16 South Summit um, project. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have regarding the resolution. Council members, questions, comments? If not, would someone like to make to move the resolution? Rob Wu, and then Lorianne. So moved. Okay, Lorianne. Second. Okay, uh, I will call the roll. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Council Member Spiegel. Aye. Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. Council Member Sales. Aye. And Council Member Sesma. Aye. All right, carries unanimously. That was. That was pretty easy. We're looking forward to, to a furnished, awesome new building. Um, okay, next. Thank you, Dennis. Um, next tech team, if you could bring up Louise Kaufman, Kaufman, I should say. Um, Louise, welcome. Uh, we are going to talk about the extension of the um, loan with MHP. Go right ahead, Louise. You are actually, Louise, you're on mute right now. There you go. There you go. Thanks. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight, um, I'm presenting a resolution author of, of the Mayor and City Council authorizing the city manager to negotiate an, oh, wrong one, sorry about that. Um, resolution of the Mayor and City Council authorizing the city manager to extend the city loans to Montgomery Housing Partnership under the same terms and conditions until December 30th, 2021. As you may remember, in May of 2020, I brought a similar resolution before you to extend their $736,000 loans through December 2020, if the state had approved the tax credit and low income housing tax credit financing. And if they had not, I'm sorry, I'm getting this completely backwards. If the state had approved the, the tax credit financing, the extension would be through December 30th, 2021. Although the state has reviewed all of the, the project elements, is considering and is um, likely to approve the loans, they have not provided final approval of those loans. Therefore, either the mayor and council have to extend the $736,000 loan to December 2021, which is what this resolution is requesting, or the loans were due January of this year. So as, as you know, COVID has created chaos in every local and state and county government. And the, you know, because of the staffing and other issues related to the significant workloads on all of us, um, the state has not had an opportunity to take these loans through the final levels of approval. They intend to do so. They believe that the approvals will be issued in 
you know, July, August, September of 2021, um, but that hasn't happened yet. And so my request to you tonight is that you allow a, another extension of these loans through December 30th, 2021, at which time they will repay the $736,000 outstanding loans as well as about $29,000 in outstanding interest if that interest has not been paid previously. Thank you, Louise. Um, this, as far as I'm concerned, this all, this all makes sense. This is one of these reverberations from the pandemic that has sort of put a delay on, on the, the expected normal workings of the state uh, and you know, it makes to me all makes all the sense in the world to approve the resolution and grant a further extension because these are these are circumstances beyond anybody's control. Lorianne, I saw your hand go up. Go right ahead. Yes, Mayor, I'd like to move the resolution to approve the uh, extension for the uh, MHP loan repayment. Thank you, Lorianne. And I saw Mike's hand go up first. Yeah, I'll second the resolution. I think our uh, partnership with MHP has been a, a good one, both uh, in the relationship with them, but also in their service to the, uh, the tenants and the community. All right, um, well, we have a motion and a second. Um, I will call the roll. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed say nay. Council Member Spiegel. Aye. Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. Council Member Sales. Aye. And Council Member Sesma. Aye. All right, carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Louise. Thank you. Next, we are gonna hear from, Lynn Board is gonna lead us in our, and we have Lauren Klingler um, to lead us in our discussion about the voting methods for the 2020, 2021 election. Uh, thank you, Mayor. The item before you tonight is a resolution for the Mayor and Council to approve the voting methods for the 2021 election. Um, as the Council is aware, the, the Charter does grant to the Board of Supervisors of Elections the authority to operate the uh, election itself, but does provide that they shall make a recommendation to the Mayor and Council as to the, the number and location of polling places. So the resolution before you this evening would um, approve the polling places for the next election. Um, as the council is also aware, the, the BOSC held a public forum on December 10th of 2020 uh, to discuss election methods and the mayor and council did participate in that forum. And then there was also a public survey that was available for six months uh, or for six weeks, excuse me, not six months, uh, for the public to, to weigh in on the voting methods as well. Um, team, if you could bring up the PowerPoint, please. That begins a packet page 155. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. I'm gonna go through a lot of this pretty quickly because I, I think you've seen a lot of this information before, but there are um, a, a few additional slides that you've not seen before. So certainly um, in the past in the city elections have primarily focused on in-person voting. Uh, we did have an absentee ballot process. Uh, we've also had early voting in the last um, three city elections and then voting at six polling places on election day itself. Next slide, please. So for the 2019 election, which was of course an uncontested election, uh, we did not have a great voter turnout. It was 6.54%. 6 um, so this does show you kind of a breakdown of the number of registered voters and uh, how they did cast those ballots. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide, again, kind of shows you our, our voter history, um, and you will see in two years, 2013 and 19, very low voter turnout. So those were non-contested elections. Um, generally, in contested elections, we average between 10 and 12 percent voter turnout. Next slide, please. Uh, so we did look at Rockville, as you all are aware. Um, in 2019, Rockville went to a mail-in voting process. Um, historically, they've had higher voter turnout than the city, usually around 16 to 17 percent. 
Um, and in the 2019 election, when they went to a, a vote-in process, their turnout increased to 29%. So a, a significant increase in their voter turnout. Next slide, please. So one of the questions that uh, the council asked during the, the BOSC forum was how did people vote in the most recent uh, 2020 general election that the county ran? Again, in, in that election, um, all registered voters were sent a, a voter, a mail-in vote application where they could request a, a mail-in ballot. Uh, they did conduct early voting and then election day voting um, as you can see by this graphic, certainly the, the large, large percentage of people voted by mail uh, with early voting being the second largest and then, you know, fairly small turnout on election day itself. Um, these are countywide statistics. We were not able to get statistics um, for the general election just specific to, to Gaithersburg. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we also looked at the cost of the election. So generally city elections have run uh, between fifteen dollars and $55,000 to operate the election. Where Rockville, when they held similar in-person elections cost around a little over $100,000 uh, for their most recent 2019 vote in mail election, the cost was over um, $200,000. Next slide, please. Uh, this was also a question that the council asked during the, the BOSE forum was to take a look at the cost per vote in comparing Gaithersburg to Rockville. So from this chart, you can see in a typical contested city election, the cost runs between 14 and $15 per vote. Um, certainly in 2019, the cost was higher at $22. Um, and again, that was an uncontested election. Um, Rockville's cost uh, per vote in 2015 in their in-person vote, in-person election was $16 uh, per voter and for their mail-in voter that did go up to uh, almost $18 per vote. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we did have a survey that was open for um, six weeks. We had 201 responses to that. And there were some clear trends that came out um, as a result of that survey. Um, we did see a high preference for mail-in voting um, while retaining some in-person voting option. Uh, there was also significant for support for using ballot drop boxes for returning in mail-in ballots. And there was also a willingness to, to travel in some cases, no matter what distance to vote, but um, certainly the overwhelming majority were willing to travel at least five miles in order to exercise their right to vote in person. Next slide, please. So the, um, the BOSE did discuss various election processes and um, their recommendation is a hybrid election process. So how that would work would be that all voters would receive a ballot application by mail without having to request one. Um, then if the voter chooses, they can complete the application. And once that's approved, they would be mailed a ballot. They would cast that ballot. And um, then they could either return that via the mail or at a Dropbox location. Uh, they would also have the ability to return the ballot at a voting center on either early voting or election day. Next slide, please. So we did look at the cost for a hybrid election cycle. And um, you know, certainly this slide shows what we anticipate would be the election, the estimated election cost. Now there, there are some areas here where, um, you know, we think that there could be some cost savings. This does show uh, like $17,500 for voting for ballot boxes. That would be if the city purchased the boxes. Um, we have contact at the State Board of Elections to see if we could borrow theirs uh, versus having to buy our own or possibly leasing. Uh, so we are looking at, you know, obviously some ways to uh, reduce the cost, but the most significant costs are really the, the cost of um, mailing notices to our residents that we are potentially changing the election process, mailing out the, um, the applications and the ballots themselves. So that is a significant increase in cost in those particular areas. Next slide, please. So the, the BOSE did recommend the hybrid process, which again would um, result in a mail-in 
ballot application being mailed to all registered voters. We would have drop boxes available in locations around the city. And then on for both early voting, we would have two early voting days and then one in person voting on election day. And they're recommending that be at one voting center, which would be the activity center at Border Park. Um, I do want to say we've had uh, some discussion as to the drop box locations. Um, staff does have a recommendation to the BOSE uh, to have six drop boxes um, located around the city. Uh, the BOSE hasn't approved that yet. They'll be talking about that at their March meeting. But the proposed locations would be at City Hall, at the Activity Center, at the Catlin's Mansion, at the Robertson Youth Center, at the Aquatic Center, and then also at Asbury. Next slide, please. Can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, give you a rundown at least of some of the key dates for the 2021 election. Um, while it's not really relevant to tonight, one thing I did want to mention to the council um, and to any potential candidates out there is, you know, certainly uh, we do require all candidates to complete a petition that requires 100 signatures um, for reg uh, of registered voters in the city. Uh, the board was concerned given the, the COVID uh, conditions. And um, since those, the, the candidate petitions will be due or available in May, um, they were concerned about candidates, you know, going out and meeting potential voters in person. Uh, so they did ask staff to develop a online form, an online um, methodology in order to get signatures on candidate petitions. And um, staff has worked to have uh, this type of application prepared. And um, again, that will be the final version. The BOSC has seen a draft version of that, um, but uh, they will be hopefully be approving the final version of that um, at, their, at their May meeting. So again, that will make it a little bit easier uh, to obtain those signatures in, in, a, in a safe and more socially distant way. Um, this is kind of the draft of what that, that form would look at look like. We are requesting more information from the person signing the petition than we do on the current petition. And that's in order to have additional verification uh, for those electronic forms. The candidates would still have the option of doing the paper forms as well, or a combination of both the online and the, and the paper forms. Okay, if we can go back to the, I guess we don't really need to go back to the PowerPoint because the last side, slide was just questions. Um, staff is here available to answer any questions that you may have, uh, but we are looking for you to confirm the BOSC's recommendation and to approve the uh, activity center as the, the one polling place for the both early voting and in-person voting for the 2021 election. Thank you, Lynn. Um, before I go to Ryan, I see your hand up there. We're, we're, we're going to get to you next. Um, I uh, want to thank you and the Board of Supervisors of Elections for all the thought that you put into um, adapting to this odd year, this odd situation. I, you know, as as far as I'm concerned, uh, the the recommendations seem very reasonable, and um, I, I think they've done a good job. So, with that, I'll go to, to go to Ryan, and then we'll go to whichever other council members want to speak up on this. Go ahead, Ryan. Thanks, Mayor. I'll echo the thanks uh, to staff and to the BOSC. Um, the first thing I just wanted to sort of underscore uh, what you said at the beginning of your presentation, and uh, what's reflected in the text of the draft uh, resolution, which is that we are not being asked tonight to vote on anything other than the approval of the location and number of in-person polling places. We are not being asked to bless the BOSE plan for uh, absentee ballot voting uh, because that is solely their purview under our city law. It's not our purview, right? Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, um, so I uh, just wanna make sure everybody was on the same page on that. And then I guess the second thing I wanted to ask, and I know this was covered a bit in our discussion in the joint public hearing, but uh, maybe you could convey a little bit why the BOSE decided 
not to do kind of a direct mailing of ballots themselves, but instead that sort of two-tiered process where they'd be mailing out um, ballot applications and then only sending ballots to people who submitted back the application. So people would actually have to submit two, two things um, and why it, uh, they, they decided to go that way instead of the other way. I imagine there are balancing costs and other security concerns, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about their logic. Sure, I mean, I think it was, was really kind of, um, kind of three main points is um, one was cost because if you go truly with the, the, the completely mail-in ballot process, um, it does increase the, the, the cost uh, fairly significantly. Um, there's also um, some security concerns uh, with that methodology as well. And I think their third factor was really, they, they see this as maybe a kind of a transition election. Um, you know, maybe this is the transition election between in-person and a completely vote by mail election. Uh, to kind of, kind of give the public an opportunity to kind of ease into a completely vote by mail election. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly the Rockville uh, new model that we've been looking at and comparing and studying um, is just a direct mailing of ballots with no required application process. So okay. if that's the ultimate direction we're moving in, I'd be very interested to see us moving in that direction. But I take the point that this is a, a bit of an experiment for us and, tra and transition. Thank you, that's all I have. Neil, please. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, Lynn and Lauren for the presentation and the BOSC for all the work. Um, I think everything makes perfect sense and I support everything that you've proposed. I do have a question on one element though, on the, uh, on the electronic petition. You know, it's always been the case, at least in my opinion, that the gathering 100 valid names on the petition is a pretty low bar uh, to get people on the ballot. In this case, I think the bar is going up because getting people to uh, sign an electronic petition is a multiple stage process instead of just meeting people at, a, at the book festival, for example, or at another public event and getting them to sign a piece of paper. You have to somehow get them to go to a website and probably involves some marketing, some expense, some expertise that's outside of the typical realm at this stage of a campaign. Um, before you came up with this uh, presentation, I was thinking about it and I'm just thinking that maybe we should just waive the, the petition requirement this time around. Um, has that been discussed? Is it, are people concerned about the petition process being more challenging this time around? Um, well, I think that, again, they did have a lot of discussion on that particular issue, and that's why, you know, they certainly don't want to make it mandatory that candidates use the, the electronic petition um, methodology. They wanted to give you the option of either continuing to use the paper uh, version or um, using the electronic. Um, so, you know, I think that there, there are pros and cons to both. Um, the problem with waiving it is it is a charter requirement. So, you know, I don't know that they would have the authority to, to just waive. All right. I understand that paper still works, but I think that with COVID, paper is, you know, just as problematic as everything else that requires in-person contact. So, yeah. but if, uh, yeah, I mean, as you say, it requires a charter change, that is its whole other ball of wax. So, um, Right, and I think it's it's really a verification process or concern because you know on the paper you do have a signature, so um, you, we can compare that against the the registered voter signature on the the voting rolls. Whereas with the electronic, we won't have a signature, and I think that's why we're asking for additional data in order to be able to verify yeah, uh, the, not, the individuals. Not identity. that it's necessarily a good idea, but I registered for an online class and I had to verify my identity by sending them a picture of my driver's license, which I can take with the camera on the computer. Um, I, that may be overkill as well. I'm just concerned that it makes it hard, but hopefully anyone who's considering being a candidate this time around is getting themselves uh, prepared for this new, new improved system, including the petition signature uh, issue, as well as getting people to vote. Thanks. If you're concerned about that being hard, scanning a driver's license, 
that that would be quite a hurdle to add to it. Okay, uh, Council Member Wu. Thanks, Mayor, and thank you, Lynn, uh, for the presentation. Um, per perhaps I should know the answer to this, having gone through two elections. But is there a methodology to for a voter to confirm that their mail-in ballot has been received and counted at any point prior to the election? Um, there is a uh, methodology to the, the software that, that we use, and Lauren's probably better expert at this than I am, uh, where we can verify that their ballot has been received. Um, we could not confirm that it's been counted until election day itself. Okay, and so say they mail their ballot in in mid October. They'd know by mid by late October that it was received, and not necessarily have to wait for election day. Okay, so I'm still getting Christmas cards about 45 days later. And I'm sure, the mail system will improve. Hopefully, it will by then. Mike, please. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, and to the BOSE, I think this election is going to be different as well because our uh, uh, chair of the Board of Supervisors of Election will be a new person this year. So uh, that'll be a big change in almost 20 years. Um, I had similar, uh, you know, I had the similar concerns that, that Neil has already raised about the petition. I, I still believe it's a low bar. Uh, I think that perhaps there might be a couple of different ways that, that we can accomplish that, that perhaps a candidate can have um, petition signatures mailed in, I suppose. Um, the, I think the biggest risk that we're dealing with in terms of a, a, an election that's going to be conducted largely by mail is that we still have to depend on the US Postal Service, which still has some major problems. They, they don't seem to have recovered at all from the last election and it's not clear how quickly the current administration is going to be able to fix that those problems so i think there's going to have to be a lot of marketing and uh, uh, education about uh, getting the votes in and and so the the drop boxes make a lot of sense uh, the one question i had about the voting center and uh, both for early voting and in-person voting on election day is uh, we've had a long relationship with Asbury in terms of a location for a voting site on that campus. And I think it's, you know, for different reasons. Uh, has, was there any thought of maintaining a polling place uh, for those three days at Asbury? Yeah, we um, we did discuss that because there was, there was some concern there. Um, and we, certainly when we reached out to Asbury, Asbury with regard to having a drop box there, they were very excited and willing to accommodate uh, to make sure that that would happen. Um, we have found in the past that um, we do get a large number of our absentee ballots from Asbury. Um, I think that, and there was uh, some indication that um, in the last general election that a large portion of the Asbury voters did vote by mail as well. Uh, so we got some impression that there was a preference um, from the Asbury residents to, to be able to mail in or to have a drop box at their location uh, versus the in-person. So I think that that was something that the board considered and, and thought was, was kind of key to their, their decision. Okay. And so, you know, really my last question, can we re review the location of the drop boxes again, please? Yeah, and again, I, I do want to say these are only staff recommended. These okay. are not been approved by the BOSC yet, uh, but we were looking at having one at um, City Hall, the Activity Center, the Catlins Mansion, the Robertson Youth Center, the Aquatic Center, and Asbury. Aquatic Center at Gaithersburg Junior High School, uh, Middle School. At middle school, correct, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we do for all of our drop boxes, we would require that there be um, 24 hour camera coverage. It's one of the, the conditions for having it uh, be a location to ensure the security of the ballots. Yeah, so I was gonna ask about the Old Town Youth Center as, as an option as well, so. I mean, that would be an, uh, another option as well, but we were trying to get them a little bit more evenly distributed. I mean, there is a little bit of a concentration towards, um, you know, the right. old, old Town uh, Gathersburg, but um, you know, we did wanna try to get them spread out a little bit citywide. Okay, um, that's it. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. 
Lori Ann, did you have anything? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, so thank you to staff and uh, the recommendations uh, that have been uh, shared. Uh, my concerns were about the um, availability of um, how we would approach the petitions this year and all of the other changes that are um, going to be taken in this year's election. And so um, I'm glad that we have some alternatives. It looks like um, we have more than enough time to uh, collect these electronic signatures if that is what is uh, going to be confirmed as the method um, for the petition. I'm not opposed or um, I think it's always important to reach out to the residents and thought it was very helpful to ask for uh, signatures just as another way to raise awareness about the upcoming election. So it is going to be interesting to see how um, we're going to navigate the collection um, and the verification process and how that's all going to work. Um, I would have preferred that we just mail the ballots out, but I guess this would be helpful in tracking who actually wants to receive uh, a mail-in ballot and who um, feels comfortable uh, using the Dropbox. And so I know we had a lot of uh, activity with uh, voters using the Dropbox uh, throughout the last uh, election cycle. So I'm glad that we're providing options and um, we're really thinking thoughtfully about how to uh, engage uh, more residents in the local election process. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the final recommendations are. And if we do move forward with this hybrid, um, waiting to see what the uh, turnout will be and hopefully uh, it will be higher than it has been. Um, I've noticed that in the past three election cycles, the uh, numbers have continuously gone down. And so I'm um, looking forward to seeing if this uh, change will uh, increase voter turnout. So thank you to all involved for the recommendations. All right, thank you council members. Would someone like to move the resolution? Mike? I'll uh, <laughs> move the, re uh, the resolution to adopt the recommendations from the, uh, on the next election for the BOSE. Okay, Lorianne? Second. Okay, I will call the roll. All those in favor say aye, any opposed say nay. Council Member Wu? Aye. Council Member Sesma? Aye. Council Member Sales? Aye. Council Member Harris? Aye. And Council Member Spiegel? Aye. Okay, carries unanimously. Uh, Lynn, Lauren, BOSE, we thank all of you. Thank you. Um, if I could mention just one other, one other thing very quickly. Um, you all were hopefully we'll remember that um, during the last or prior to the last election, um, the board did bring to you election regulations, which you all approved uh, via resolution. Um, we are planning on bringing those back to you um, probably the end of March, beginning of April timeframe. Um, because of the change in the voting methods, we need to update the regulations as well. So you will see those uh, in a couple months. Okay, we'll look forward to that. Thank you. All right, thanks. Next tech team, if you could bring up John Schlichting, please. And we are gonna talk about the zoning text amendment before us. Should John, we, welcome and we take it away. Rob and Tom, I believe. Oh, bring them all on. Good evening, mayor and council. I am John Schlichting, your director of planning and code administration. And this item before you tonight is an ordinance to amend chapter 24 of, of the city code to define public uses to exclude all residential in all of our non-residential Euclidean zones. This text amendment was introduced on September 21st. The joint public hearing was held on November 16th. The planning commission recommended approval on January 6th and your record closed at 5 p.m. on January 13 with 44 exhibits. I should note that your cover sheet says there were 42 exhibits, which were posted on the city's website last Thursday. 
Two more were found on Friday and the website was updated accordingly. As we discussed at the public hearing, this text amendment only applies in our commercial employment and industrial zones where residential is not a permitted use currently. We do want to emphasize that this text amendment in no way addresses the merits of affordable or transitional housing, which of course is a major priority for the city. In fact, the city of Gaithersburg has a larger percentage of affordable housing than surrounding Montgomery County. What this text amendment is about is avoiding conflicting land uses and reinforcing the purpose of the master plan. This text amendment will exclude all types of residential in all of our zones where residential is already not a permitted use by redefining public use, which is a permitted, permitted use in all of these zones to exclude residential. Public uses have always been seen as direct functions of government entities that serve all of the community, like parks, schools, city halls, police stations, roads, and utilities. Residential uses are always privately occupied. Staff readily admits that public entities that provide affordable housing are providing an important and essential public benefit, again, a priority for the city, but any kind of housing by its very nature is not a public use. Furthermore, including residential as a public use actually circumvents the master plan, circumvents the intent of non-residential zones, and circumvents the roles of the mayor and council, the planning commission, and most importantly, the public in the master plan process. During the public hearing, staff was asked to research how other jurisdictions address public use, the possibility of applying conditional use requirements, and whether other public uses should be prohibited. There is a comprehensive memo in your package addressing all of these issues, but any significant changes to the ordinance before you tonight would require an entirely new public process. So staff recommends that your policy discussion tonight be limited to the ordinance before you. The Planning Commission did unanimously recommend approval of this text amendment on January 6th and their discussion focused on the importance of retaining the clarity of our Euclidean zones. The commission considers this a housekeeping amendment since residential was never contemplated in any of these seven zones. They acknowledge that two examples of public use housing in commercial zones do exist in the city, but they all agreed that they should not be used as a precedent for undermining the intent of the seven zones or the purpose of the master plan. In conclusion, staff recommends that the mayor and council adopt text amendment CTAM 8611-2020. And Tom, Rob, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, John, um, Tom, and Rob. Uh, so look, I agree entirely with the planning commission here. This is a housekeeping uh, endeavor here. What we're doing is housekeeping. And it essentially, as I said during the public hearing, uh, we're saying, we're clarifying that when we have a commercial zone, we mean commercial and not residential. And when we have a residential zone, we mean residential, not commercial. It's, it really is not complicated. The only thing that's made this complicated is that the applicant uh, who was going, who had, they have this property, it is zone commercial, and they were going through a rezone because they want to put this residential use on this property uh, as they should. They were going through this, this rezone when they came across this language and, and uh, interpretation of, this, of a clause that hasn't been really used or contemplated in the city of Gaithersburg in decades um, that allows them to say, no, this, this commercial zone really means, it really actually means there should be residential here. This, this residential use. Um, it, it was a surprise to, uh, to everybody that you're looking at on the screen here uh, that, this inter that, that, that this clause could be interpreted in such a way. Um, there is some disagreement with that interpretation. I'm sure it, uh, Council Member Spiegel will, will, will bring, up, bring that up at some point. Um, but either way, uh, what we're doing here tonight, if we do pass this zoning text amendment, is not 
we are not saying no to this project. We are saying to this project, no, you were right the first time, you need to go through rezoning and we will consider your project just the same as we would consider any residential project in a commercial zone. You have to rezone first to be considered. It's just not, it's, it's just a simple thing. And the only complicating factor is that the applicant in wanting to take this shortcut, the applicant has gone to the community and said, no, if the city of Gaithersburg makes us go through this rezoning, they obviously don't like affordable housing. They obviously don't like the elderly. They don't like senior housing. Sure, we don't. Sure, that's that's exactly what this is all about. No, that's it's it's a it's a ridiculous spin, and I'm sorry that a number of people on our committees and in our community um, have are are sort of buying that that line that, that's very convenient for this for this applicant um, but the fact is this is housekeeping clarifying that the language in our our zones means what the language says and how any reasonable person would interpret it and if we pass it they get to go go and do the same process that anybody else would have to do so although i don't have a vote on this i would support it 100 percent. who wants to speak next to this We'll go to Lorianne. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, this seems pretty clear to me as well. Um, you know, our region is definitely um, in need of uh, transit oriented development. It's definitely a top priority, but our decisions are guided by our zoning code. Um, and these decisions, uh, um, ensure compliance with uh, neighboring parcels, um, uh, helps us regulate the aesthetics of our community and um, how it complements with uh, other projects outlined in our master plan. And so um, I don't see why we're not adhering to the process that's set forth when we want to uh, um, navigate away from the prescribed designation for this particular area. And so um, that that's really all um, I wanted to share. Um, I, I definitely think that um, with any project that comes forth, I would expect um, anyone to uh, um, use the current pathways that um, were explained and um, I'm not sure why the uh, process was uh, halted, but um, we have a framework in place to ensure that um, these projects are um, prevent any conflicts with uh, any land use um, that is being planned. And so um, it ensures uh, adherence to uh, public health and safety guidelines. And so um, I will uh, yield the rest of my time to see if any other comments want to be shared by my client, by my colleagues. All right. Council Member Sales yields, and we will go to uh, Mike Sesma. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, I'm in uh, complete agreement with the um, recommendations of the Planning Commission. Uh, I do believe this is a housekeeping uh, issue and doesn't preclude any other proposals that, that any property in this zone might, uh, uh, might be proposed for any other properties within this zone. And uh, it just defines what a public use is. I'm satisfied that this is, is pretty clear uh, and I'll, I'm supporting the ZTA. Yeah. That's it. Thank you, Mike. Rob Wu. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, and, and thank you to, to staff for all of the information that was put in the packet. It really did help formulate my thoughts on the matter. Um, so I have a slightly different take on um, both what the ordinance says on the books now, as well as the, the ZTA. And so, I, you know, I, I look at the language of 
uh, the, the current ordinance, the definition of public and its application to each of the Euclidean zones. And I, I simply don't read it and, and don't see how it could be read to include the use um, of a, a private residential, market rate residential. Um, it, it seems pretty clear to me that the definition on the books now requires public use and benefit in the conjunctive, um, meaning the public has to have access to it. And so unless we're going to allow people to come into the apartments uh, and, and, you know, raid the refrigerator, it's, it's not public use. It's, it's private lease terms, so private restricted access to the properties. Now, I do think that, you know, if you were to have a use on the property, such as a senior center that is open to the public, that is a public use within the definition of our current ordinance. And so one of the issues that I've got is that um, the, the ZTA kind of is, is um, taking a step that I don't think is necessary. Um, I don't think it's necessary because I think the current ordinance um, precludes uh, residential uses on the property. Um, one of the issues that I've kind of got with the ZTA is, is that if I'm wrong, and I'm not, humbly, then, um, you know, the current regime or the current codification of that particular use and it, if it does permit it, then this ZTA is kind of, you know, an 11th hour pulling the rug out from under um, uh, individuals and companies or applicants who might come in and try to seek to use residential uses if they had a reasonable belief, a reasonable interpretation that the code did permit it, which I don't think that's a reasonable use. So um, there's that. Um, what I do have now that we focused on the public use exception is kind of the, the second, third order effects of it. And I'll explain a little bit more about what my concerns are. And I kind of alluded to it in the last meeting is that, you know, public use is broad and in these Euclidean zones, it's by right. And so, you know, we all look at that property and think of what uses could go there. Um, and think of what might conflict and what may not conflict. Well, my reading of the code is if, if you know, there's been this discussion recently about um, innovative schools. And so if they wanted to turn, if an applicant wanted to come in and turn that into a school with a horrible accesses to it, there's no place to walk, um, they could do that by right under our current code. If they wanted to install an incinerator on that site, publicly used and you know arguably it, it, you know if the incinerator it falls under the public use it's public it is open into the benefit of the public generally um they could build an incinerator there and we could have no say in that at all um and it's arguable about whether incinerator fall under public use it does fall under certain other of our, of our neighboring jurisdictions definition of public there's this whole panoply of public uses that could fall under that by right exception, which I don't, I'm not comfortable with. And so uh, I'm gonna vote against this ZTA, but what I would ask is that we take a hard look at that language. I think we could address a lot of those concerns about placing incinerators on corners and, uh, you know, a, a school or any other public use. You know, we can put, Mike's talked about a stadium or arena. If we could fit that on five acres, they could buy right, put that there so long as it's a public use. Um, conditional use satisfies that. Conditional use allows us to take a, a hard look at whether or not that public use is uh, harmonious with that area. And you can do that outside of the entire zoning process. And you'd have to because you've got a big hole in your zoning process called public use. Now, I don't think if we go the conditional use route, it's going to help the applicant because if we make the public use conditional, it's still gonna be the same definition of public use, which I don't think includes the residential component. I would also like to amend the definition of public use to permit us to look at such things. And we could do that by putting, for example, 
a, a component test. You know, there is a, a, a predominant public use or a significant public use that would allow other not accessible to the public, but still beneficial to the public type of uses on the property. I don't know if you wanted to take, for example, a hotel and turn the first floor into a senior center and the upper floors into, uh, you know, MPDUs or senior housing or something like that. I would like to amend the public use definition and then make all of these public uses a, a, a conditional so that we would have the control to review what actually goes onto the site. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Who would like to go next? Go ahead, Neil. So with all due respect to Rob, who is an attorney, I think the city attorney's staff has already passed judgment on whether or not uh, public use is, it has been what the applicant thinks it is. And that's the purpose of the ZTA to make sure that it isn't. So um, I think any discussion of conditional use should come afterward, but at this point we need to clean up the language to make sure that the zone is what we say it is. And if the applicant has an issue with, with the zone and wants to make a change, there's a process that we can go through to uh, make sure that that is handled appropriately. So I'll keep it short. I support the ZTA uh, just for the purpose of making sure that the, the zone, uh, the purpose of the zones is kept to the intent that I think we all believe it is. Ryan, do you want to add anything? My, my the only council member who hasn't commented yet. Correct. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll I'll weigh in. Um, uh, you know, I'll I'll be honest that I I struggle. Um, I do believe generally we as a city can be are open to create solutions to expand our housing stock and to promote successful adaptive reuse in a variety of contexts. I also generally don't like the feeling that we may we may be perceived as changing rules midstream, and I'm sensitive to that. Um, but in the end, I actually I agree with Councilmember Wu. Uh, ZTA because I'm I'm not sure that the legal interpretation of public use that has been embraced in this discussion is ultimately the correct one, regardless of city staff or uh, what um, opinions we may have received from other interested parties uh, in this discussion, uh, none of whom are judges uh, opining with a meaning uh, of the term in the law. Um, I just find it hard to imagine that the intent of the current zoning text language was to allow any use whatsoever, uh, so long as it is backed by a governmental or quasi-governmental body or can be justified as a quote unquote public use. And I think Rob did a good job going through some different possible uses that could be considered public use. So in my mind, uh, because of that, at most the CTA is really more of a clarification and not a change. Uh, and I think that is consistent with the Planning Commission's view that this is a housekeeping matter. Um, but from that analysis, I reach a different conclusion from Rob because I think it actually makes sense to approve this to clarify the intent, which I believe was always the intent, uh, whether or not such clarification is, is really required. Uh, Rob's comments reminded me of a quote from the movie The Princess Bride, where one of the characters says, unless I am wrong, and I am never wrong, um, so uh, I, I think you are correct in this situation, Rob, but I reach a different conclusion as a result of it. The problem uh, with uh, the idea of conditional use is that we'd have to have this same debate every single time that an individual project was before us going forward, which would basically put us right back in a similar situation. Uh, and we're really supposed to be talking more broadly um, about about zoning and land use uh, in this context. But either way, uh, even if we were to entertain a conditional use option, that would have to be a subsequent process after tonight's policy discussion and 
uh, presumed vote on what we have before us. I do want to say I appreciate the public comments uh, we've received over the weeks that recognize the city of Gaithersburg's strong commitment to affordable housing over many years, uh, as the mayor has explained. And I do have to say I'm disappointed that we haven't seen the same level of interest from those uh, who have opposed this ZTA in the name of supporting one specific proposal for affordable senior housing, uh, when we have had numerous, dozens and dozens of hearings and public meetings, when we were setting up our housing initiative fund or strengthening our MPDU laws or establishing and expanding our GHALP program, which provides first time home buyers with loans uh, or loaning hundreds of thousands of dollars to preserve and improve low income multifamily properties, as we discussed earlier tonight, um, or establishing our financial literacy programs through Bank on Gaithersburg to help people obtain a mortgage, and so on and so on. Um, so um, I think that it's important to put this discussion in context, but as much as this legislation before us has been associated with the use of a particular property, this ZTA, as has been said, really doesn't have anything to do with whether or not we support affordable housing or whether um, we support it generally or any, any specific site within the city. It has to do with whether our zoning authority and our land use and our master planning processes mean anything, whether they have any teeth or whether they can just be circumvented by exceptions that are interpreted so broadly as to potentially render our zoning meaningless. If zoning that distinguishes certain areas for certain uses is essentially rendered a nullity because of a legal interpretation that I believe strains common sense, that strikes at the heart of the concept of zoning itself. And it opens the door for arguments that anything can be built anywhere, regardless of the master plans that have required countless hours of public input and the work and effort by our city staff adhering to state law and other formal procedures and processes to develop those master plans. Anyone who can creatively manage to characterize themselves as supporting a public purpose could drive a Mack truck through those limited exceptions in our laws and that whole point of zoning will be threatened. And we'd be more like those wild west jurisdictions that don't have any advanced land use planning where commercial corridors reflect just a, a disorganized mishmash of uses of whatever the market will bear at a particular moment. So that's my sense of this. And I don't think we can rely on the requirement that's been brought up a couple of times uh, under state law that a municipality must provide an authorizing resolution for so-called other operations of the housing authority. Uh, first of all, we can't seem to find any prior instances of such a resolution uh, with respect to other projects in the city where this zoning exception was allegedly relied on. And even if we could, I'm not convinced we'd actually be able to place specific enforceable conditions on a specific project through such a resolution. Uh, plus the resolution requirement only applies to other operations, whatever those are. I think we need to protect our broader zoning authority. Um, and I think we need to do that precisely so that we can better ensure land use that is mixed use, that includes affordable housing, that is denser and more environmentally sensitive. And the notion that this ZTA cuts against those priorities is respectfully, in my view, a bit backwards, holding up one isolated case to try to prove a broader point that really isn't there. And in fact, our city has been moving boldly on affordable housing for years and continues to do so. Now, over and over again during this debate, we've heard about how good mixed use would be for this site. But that's sort of the point. We have a mixed use zone and we are well known throughout the region and even the nation for our mixed use developments. And if this ZTA passes, I concede we should work hard to make sure that we're providing as much clarity and certainty as we can as to whatever other paths forward might exist for reuse of any particular property. Uh, recognizing there's never a 100% guaranteed outcome in the planning and zoning process, but we should try to make it um, as clear and as uh, reliable uh, as possible for applicants going forward. So that's my view. 
Thank you, Ryan. So uh, would someone like to move the ordinance? Mike, go right ahead. I'll move the ordinance, uh, ZTAM, what, what's the number here? <laughs> I'll move the ordinance, sorry. Okay, Neil. Second. Okay, I will call the roll. Um, all those in favor say aye, any opposed say nay. We'll start with council member Sales. Aye. Cal council member Wu. Nay. Nay, okay, council member Sesma. Aye. Council member Harris. Aye. Council member Spiegel. Aye. Okay, so the ordinance passes 4-1 with council member Wu voting against. Uh, thank you to, to staff for getting us this far and, and uh, we appreciate all the work. And now let me see what's next on our agenda. Sorry, I lost it on my screen here. Um, next we have, have from city attorney. Anything, Lynn? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. I just had one thing this evening. I wanted to thank the mayor and council for their support and authorization to proceed in uh, being party to two amicus briefs that have been submitted in uh, two immigration cases. Uh, these arose based on changes that the last administration made in the waning days of that administration that would make it more difficult uh, for individuals to become naturalized citizens. And then there was one that dealt with the uh, limited immigration judge's ability to consider those cases. Um, the uh, more procedural case is pending in the Northern District of California and the amicus brief in that case was filed on Friday and the city uh, was one of 28 local jurisdictions that supported that brief. Uh, the other case is pending in the District Court of Columbia, the U.S. District Court of Columbia, and that amicus brief will be filed tomorrow. So thank you, for, thank you for your continuing support on immigration issues. Thank you, Lynn. And um, I, I will put this out to John and Tom and Dennis. Do we have anything from any other staff? Not seeing anything. Okay, I will remind you we have uh, a work session next Monday, February 8th, uh, to receive an update from the Montgomery County Department of Transportation um, and a, a project briefing on the Washingtonian Boulevard low stress bicycle connection. And the next regular meeting of the Mayor Council is on Tuesday uh, after the Monday holiday, February 16th. Until next time, let's do great things, Gaithersburg. We are adjourned. <laughs>